You're listening to Plate Mark with me, Anne Schaefer. Plate Mark is a podcast about a particular niche in the art world, that of prints and the printmaking ecosystem. We're talking about fine art prints, usually limited editions, etchings, lithographs, screen prints, relief prints. In series three, I'll introduce you to artists, printers, publishers, gallerists, curators, art historians, and conservators in order to demystify this rarefied world and show you that we're just people, albeit with some really cool jobs. In this five-part mini-series, I'm talking to five artists who were selected to be included in an exhibition called 5x5 that was part of Print Austin's Winter Festival in 2024. The juror of the show is Mishka Lewis, who's a curator at Tandem Press and whose taste I respect deeply. My guest today is one of those five artists from the 5x5 show. Her name is Annalise Gratovich. We take a deep dive into the ins and outs of Sheen Collet, and I'm telling you, it's a deep dive. We also talk about her Ukrainian heritage and inherited trauma, cuteness as a means to help viewers access difficult subjects, and her recent battle with a mysterious autoimmune disease. Let's see. Oh, housekeeping. I identify as a cis-het white woman, and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images Annalise and I talk about will be in the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. Also, do me a favor and hit the support and donate button over on the website and sign up to be a monthly supporter. You can help me keep the lights on. Your help would be most appreciated. I think that's it. Let's get rolling. Annalise, it's lovely to see you. Thank you for coming on Plate Mark today. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this and I love your podcast. I was just listening to the Valkyrie Remling episode and have just had a blast. And um, I like you a lot since we met in Baltimore (laughs) years ago. So I'm just really looking forward to chatting with you today. That's true. You you came to the Baltimore uh, at the museum when we had the print fair there back in the must have been 2015, and uh, and you were working with uh, with Catherine and Mike at Flatbed Press at that point. So yeah, That's we right. do know each other from prior days. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so and Val, you did you, you didn't did you go to Tamarind? No, oh, no, okay. I didn't. No, but I just I of course love them and follow their work and yeah. Um, yeah, just like seeing yeah. what's going on there in Tamarind. Yeah. She's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I don't know her personally. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know her personally. Yeah, she's wonderful. Well, all right. So the reason that you are on the, well, I was, I was going to get to you, I promise. (laughs) But this, it was precipitated by you being included in a Print Austin exhibition, five by five, which included, funny enough, five artists and five of their works, (laughs) which I thought was kind of a brilliant brilliant way to do it. So I'm circling around to all five of you and, um, and just eager to dig in. Before we go too far, can you introduce yourself for everybody? Yes, my name is Annalise Kratovich. I am a printmaker living and working in Austin, Texas. I work at the Blanton Museum here in my day job career as the um, matting and framing preparator. So I'm a museum tech and I oversee the um, care of the works on paper in the collection. So that's prints and drawings and photographs and books, manuscripts, so anything on paper in the museum. Um, so that's a really, really fun, dynamic job. And then I have my personal studio career as well. So they, they work pretty symbiotically, which is really enjoyable. I don't, I'm not sure that we've talked to anybody who's had any time as a preparator. Could you could briefly just tell people what does that really mean? Yeah, so I have a studio off the pretty massive prints and drawings storage area in the museum. And so I work hands-on with the objects. I don't do the installation so much of the objects unless it's something that is hands-on with the with the work that's not in a frame or if there's some you know, special if it's a, if it's an installation or something that requires special handling, I will do that. But I mat and frame um, works and I build custom housings. So things that need armatures or mounts, I'm building custom mounts for books and for sculptural prints. And I do some light conservation there. I'm in the collections department, but 
used to be in prints and drawings department. I have a, a position there that's kind of, it's almost a little hybrid between curatorial and collections. But I say all that to say that I will also kind of advise on media lines or I'll, I'll talk to colleagues a lot about um, print processes since I'm also a practicing printmaker. So that's really fun because I get to use my, my personal expertise and experience with prints and talk to my colleagues in all departments about that. So that's really fun. I, I have no doubt because this happened to us <laughs> that your curators probably don't have a lot of hands-on experience with printmaking and having somebody with your experience in the department or nearby adjacent. Oh, so helpful. Well, and it's really cool too, because sometimes we get these projects, like even as a printmaker, I will look at it and be like, I have no idea how this was done. Okay. So let's like look at it. It's almost like forensic printmaking and finding the layers and kind of deciding, okay, well, this looks like you know, a photo process, and then this looks like dry point or mesotint. You know, sometimes it, it's more often in contemporary printmaking when those are kind of like puzzles, um, but also sometimes with historic printmaking and, you know, little blips of techniques that have, have appeared over time. And yeah, I'm not an art historian, but, but also loving print. Sometimes I can find the answer. So that's fun. <laughs> are you uh, tempted at all by conservation? Oh, yes. Yeah, I love conservation. I love the science. That's one thing that's really fun with my career, because it's a lot of problem solving. And it's a lot of hands on with with the objects. So I have to know museum best practices, you know, working with papers from, you know, from vellum to photography to papers that are from the 1400s to things that are very sculptural. And, you know, I have to I have to um of course, always have this idea of preventative conservation in my handling and in my my prep work. And so that's really interesting. It's also incredibly hard to find up-to-date, really good scientific information um, because I'm outside of the conservation world. So I'm still learning. I've been I've been here at the museum for five years now. So I'm still learning the resources and what's available and how to find answers to my questions. And so sometimes that's very um, collaboration heavy. And I'll reach out to contacts in other museums locally or nationally, and and you know we'll have conversations. And it's fun to to be able to do that. That's that really scratches a collaboration itch that I have. So tell us, tell us when you figured out you were an art person. Ooh, I don't know. Sometimes I still wonder if I'm an art person, but I, I was raised by musicians. So I was raised in a very artistic household. I loved to draw and collect images and was always just a very visual person, much, much more than music. I was not musical, still I'm not musical. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was fostered in me pretty much anything I wanted to do. I was very fortunate that it was, you know, my creativity was fostered and curiosity. And so I found printmaking when I was 16 and really fell in love with it. Yeah, I know it's been, it's been almost 20 years now, which is crazy. And it fell in love with it and just decided, you know, this is the thread I'm going to pull. And it's led to a really rich life so far and a That's lot of cool. different print adjacent um, careers. Because you were a collaborative printer in your past. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I started off when I was in college um, I had a really hard time. And this is, this is funny because you and, and Valerie in that episode were talking about school structure. I had a horrible time with school structure. I, it's very difficult for me. So I would work a little bit in school and I would take a break and work and then I'd go back to school. So I started interning at Flatbed and then working at Flatbed before I graduated. And I thought I wanted to be a collaborative printmaker. And so I entered that space and then realized I was probably more interested in the collections side and then what life is the work and have once it's been made. And I really enjoyed curating and doing exhibitions. So I kind of switched. I did um, collaborative printing on certain projects um, for people. And so that was very fun. But I kind of moved away from the collaborative side, I'd say pretty early and went more to the to the gallery curatorial collection side, um, which I think really set me up for my 
different career path. I I used to talk to a long, long, long time ago, oh my gosh, um, to Ben Levy, who was in our department long ago, about this, his next choice, the same kind of idea that you had, like, I, I think I want to do this thing. And then suddenly you're like, well, but maybe I should do this other thing. And my point to him always was, if you're in a, in a print shop and you're the collaborative printer, you, you know, you'll work with 10, 15 artists in a year, <clears throat> excuse me, or whatever, but art history and you know, if you dabble in the contemporary world, like you, the variety is so much greater and your options for doing things outside of just that printing part are so much greater. And I kind of talked, I think I talked him into it, <laughs> <laughs> kind of went to the art history side, like the devil, you know? Yeah, you're so, you're so right about that. I never, I never thought about that, but it's very true. And I formed a lot of great relationships and being able, like loving someone's work and, and wanting to show it. And then having the ability to do that and expand a new audience, you know, and, and just make those introductions is really beautiful and really fun. And I loved it. I loved the time I was curating. We did a print fair as well in conjunction with Flatbed, very small um, compared to what, <laughs> tiny compared to what you have done. But it was also very difficult and really enjoyable and inviting publishers and artists to do that is is um yeah the event the event space is very um, demanding but (laughs) I loved that as well yeah Yeah, and I wish I had more time to do more curation and, and get more involved in that but um alas so many hours all right well maybe you'll carve some time out somewhere in and along the line here yeah as a 16 year old, you somehow you tripped over printmaking in school, which I find amazing that that high schools anywhere offer anything. I mean, I did a linoleum cut in fourth grade, but, you know, mm-hmm. that's different than really diving into printmaking. It's an amazing school that can offer that. Well, uh, this was Austin Community College. It was okay. not my high school. I think when I was a child, I was enrolled in some, you know, um, art camp where I did a screen print of a sunflower. That was actually my first print ever. At that time, I didn't know anything about printmaking and then came back to it in community college. But as I said, I had a really hard time with academia and that definitely started in high school. So I dropped out of high school as soon as I legally could in the state of Texas, which was the tender age of 16. Wow. And like looking back at that, I think it's just kind of crazy. And my parents, um, I guess, were supportive. My mom was supportive as long as I got higher education. She was like, as long as you, you know, you figure out what you want to do and you follow through with that, it doesn't really matter. So I was able to um, test into ACC and took classes there. And so I was really young. And our community college program in Austin is incredible. The, the school is amazing. And um, they have fashion incubators and they work with local TV stations and with um, radio programs. My, I'm still friends with my mentors, my print mentors there at the community college. And so I just love that program. I recommend it to anybody here that wants to get into anything and like find an ACC program. Um, so anyway, did that. And that's where I found printmaking. I was taking art history classes in Mm -hmm. the basement of the school, which is where the print shop was. And, um, I remember walking by and just thinking, wow, this looks really cool. Like these crazy machines and these danger signs and like, what's the acid room? And then seeing what people were making and, and the work that was coming out of there. And then the print kids were really cool. So I was just like, I want to try that. And as soon as I did, I was I was hooked. Did you start with relief and stick with relief? Or did you go all the way around the gamut? Yeah, my first class was a survey class. So we did, I don't remember which order it was, but we did relief, we did etching, and we did litho. And there wasn't a screen option at that point. And so I liked relief, loved etching, terrified of litho. So I <laughs> ended up, because I loved etching so much, I ended up really running with that and then kind of specialized in that pretty early while I had access to the chemistry into those facilities and really loved to draw. So a lot of my imagery was, was detailed and pattern heavy, which has continued into my work 
and then got back into relief later in my life. And so those are the two things that I, that I would say I specialize in now. Really right, right. Mentioned. Yeah. I, um, I mean, who doesn't love a netching? Really? Let's oh, be frank. <laughs> so luscious and just beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> Although I have to say between Valkyrie and Deb Cheney, I have, I, and Micah Barnes, the, the mm-hmm. three lithographers oh, yeah. I've talked to, you know, forcing myself into it because yeah. it's always seemed so flat to me, but I think it was Deb who described that basically the inks are, so integrated that they're in the paper, not on the paper. And that idea of the print being one with the paper, I was like, okay, all right. All right. Now I'm in. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's what I, that's what I, oh man, I love, I do love lithography and I think it's an amazing process, but yeah, I've always found myself wanting more interaction between the matrix and the substrate. And so I tend to look for that physicality. And that's why I I tend to like works on paper more than other two-dimensional media because of that relationship and the way that the matrix, you know, really impresses upon the substrate. And, you know, that's just, just that little bit of physicality can make a lot of difference. So that's how I've always thought of it. I, yeah, no, I agree with you. And I, and I sort of wonder if it's because it's, it is so the hand of the artist is so much clearer. You know? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be. Mm-hmm. But love those litho colors too. Well, that was the, I don't know if you've listened to the Deb thing, but she was, I was asking her about inks because I'm always like, I don't understand, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> playing, playing dumb. <laughs> but she was talking about how the litho inks have to be so much more saturated in color because there's such a tiny, thin microscopic layer that's going down. And in order to have any color of any power that it has to be super saturated i think that was the word too yes you know and this just reminded me that i use litho ink for my relief oh yeah. my yeah i use um it's a black hand co um that i i love printing relief it, like black ink relief classic just it's it's perfect so um i yeah i use a litho ink because it is so saturated and highly pigmented wow yeah but you, so in, in, maybe we should talk about your relief works because they are beautiful and gigantic. And I'm fascinated to hear you say that you love this, the, the perfectness of the black and the, on the paper and everything. Because mm-hmm. when you add color to your works, you don't add color through a extra p- block or anything. You're using a little piece of chine mm-hmm. And I'm, I mean, I know we've talked about chine a ton, but can you describe the act- what, how you're doing it? Yes. So I am insane with my Um, (laughs) chine I like to have a very precise color palette. And so I hand dye my papers. And um, chine is essentially a way of collaging different, in my case, hand dyed pieces of paper onto a woodcut as it's being printed. So I'm carving one key image and then I'm setting multiple pieces of dyed paper into the ink on that woodcut in the area that I want to color. And then the white paper goes over that. It all goes through the press and um, it's all glued together and printed upon at the same time. So I'm skipping a lot of technical steps of like paper hydration and adhesive types and, you know, all these all these technical things that go into that process to make it successful. But in a nutshell, it's layering papers to add color rather than a different matrix for each color. Okay, so so for for the folks at home (laughs) yeah i just want to make it clear that you've got your block sitting on your press pad and then you've got it inked up so there's ink sitting on the relief areas then the paper goes down the sheen collet pieces of paper the little pieces of color Mm -hmm. and those you've already brushed with glue on both sides one side just one side yeah just the side that's going to be touching the white paper okay Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're being held onto the block probably by the black ink. By the sticky ink. Yes. Okay, by the sticky yeah. ink. And then the big piece sheet of paper, the white paper mm-hmm. goes down and the press basically transfers all the ink and all mm-hmm. the paper and all that glue onto the piece of paper. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, if we do it right. And it's like with the current one in my series, that giant woodcut, they're life size. So the block is my height, five and a half feet. They're three by five and a half feet. That piece has about 60 different pieces of hand dyed paper in it. And um, I prepared about a thousand pieces of paper 
for that edition and all the prints that are outside of the edition and the color trials. And that's why I say I'm kind of in, insane with it. But I, I love it. And I love being experimental with that process. And to make it successful, I work with a team of three other printers. So there are four of us total. We each have a very specific role that we perform in order to have all of these materials come together on the press bed at the right time. Because if our paper gets too dry, it won't stick. If it's too wet, it won't stick. If the glue isn't on there right, I use a powdered wheat paste. If that's not on there right, it won't stick. Or it'll squish out, you know, these different problems will happen. So it's quite a, quite a process to bring it all together. And it's a lot of fun. You can see the question marks above my head, right? So yeah. <laughs> question one, is the large sheet, the base sheet, damp? Yes. Okay. Because yeah. there are ways in which you can print on dry pieces of paper, right? Like it's not always damp. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so the dampness really helps with this powdered chincolle okay. um, process. So the, the dyed paper is damp and then the, the white BFK paper is also damp. And so it's the combination of the hydration of those papers um, that really work well together when they meet um, on the press bed. And then it also helps with, um, with relief because you have those negative areas of the, the, the negative space that you're carving out. Really what's holding the paper to um, the dyed paper to the white paper is the areas where the block kisses right and mm -hmm. so that makes the strongest contact and so having the damp paper also just helps with the the receptive quality of the paper because it's just a bit more open and pillowy okay. um, the fibers have been expanded and so it helps it just really helps with that contact and makes a great beautiful embossment too is uh, i've never asked this question i don't know why it just came in my brain when the paper is damp the fibers are relaxed mm -hmm. in a way and does that mean that more ink will adhere because there's more places for it to go microscopically places mm -hmm. for it to go or is it just that it sits better on the damp you know what i'm saying i would say yes i would say yes to the first i think okay. it makes and so um yeah i think it it does really help the the paper absorb whatever it's needing um the pigmentation i okay. think absolutely even though you know we are working with oil based inks that paper is still highly receptive oh right yeah that yeah. shouldn't work should it i know but printmaking <laughs> but printmaking <laughs> <laughs> i don't know and i could be wrong about that i'm like that sounds great and makes sense somebody out there could be listening and just saying that's not right but I don't know. I don't well, know. you can you can write in and let us know we're wrong, yeah. <laughs> wherever That's you are. <laughs> but like in the 19th century, well, probably even earlier, when the papers were made out of wood and they were crappy and they weren't really receiving ink very well, mm -hmm. that's when this whole, the blossoming of Chine Collet occurred mm -hmm. because you could get such a much richer impression on those thin, thin tissues. And they were so thin and scary, they decided, right? Like, I assume mm -hmm. that's how this happened. Um, but like it's, it'd be really interesting to see just you know a little one like if all of the same ink, the same print, you know, across a, a a ton of papers, and just to sort of make that really clear about what what happens and what kind of paper is better and dry and wet, blah blah. I'm sure somebody's done it. But it sounds like a great scholarly project for somebody <laughs> out there. I would, be I would read that paper. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody write that paper, will you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We now we know about your crazy process because eighty pieces per, you know, of chinclay is kind of nuts. So to keep them all damp in the same way, it's crazy. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot, and it's and it's interesting too because one of the first when when I really was expanding my knowledge as a student, one of the first big etchings that I editioned was a diptych of two large copper plates that were, you know, I say large, they were maybe 18 by 22 ish, which is large. They were a diptych and, and it had a, it had really complicated chincolle. And then I did an addition of like 50 because I was like, I'm going to see if I can do it. So I spent a lot of time just chugging out, you know, those prints. I don't think I finished that number, but I was really just trying to, to see what I could do. 
in mm-hmm. terms of additioning and repetition and then doing matching play. So it's funny that looking back at that piece and then also seeing the insane shing clay I'm doing now, 16 year old me would be, <laughs> would be satisfied. I like to think. But I feel like in, in your prints, particularly the, the large figures, the color, I mean, they're so, they're subtle colors. They're not like, Hey, I'm fluorescent yellow or whatever. And, but they, they just sort of bring all the whole thing that kind of clicks all together, all those little pieces of play. It, they're all, it's like the exactly right thing to do. Thank you. I I think very carefully about my placement and how to turn what I think of as a black and white image, right? I'm working with key image. And I love, like I said, a black and white print. I created these pieces to be black and white prints. And then when I started co-publishing them with Flatbed Press, um, this is an ongoing series of seven. There, there will be eight total. Um, there are seven currently done. They're figurative. Each, each one is a, a separate figure. I've done, I guess I can say, average one and, and a half a year. No, one every like year and a half or so, because I've been working on it for 10 years now. So where was I going? When I started co-publishing with Flatbed, that really allowed me to expand the scope of the project. And that's when I started thinking about adding color. So I also think about it just very carefully. What is going to enhance the image that I've already designed to be very strong and finished, in my opinion, is a black and white image. How do I add a color element to that in a way that really enhances it and doesn't detract from it? And how do I make those colors you know, sophisticated so that I'm satisfied with them. That's why I started hand dyeing my paper. Um, And so I play with the placement a lot. And so that comes across in the color trials too. New times I have to completely nix a color or, you know, subtract color and have a nice stack of like black and white and then color elements and blending that together. So that's definitely a, a problem solving stage I go through. Right. Well, now you got me curious about the dyeing. How does that, <laughs> how does that work? Yeah, so I've found that um, I like using gouache pigments. Okay. Because they are very opaque. I use mulberry papers. And so the pigment really sits on the paper beautifully. And it has just a very soft, velvety quality that I like. It's, it's very different than ink on paper, than printing ink on paper. It has a very different look and texture to it. And so I really like that. So I start with color swatches and recipes. I make detailed notes with my color mixing so that when I find a color I like, I know exactly how to expand it into bulk when I'm in the color production. So now I have lots of swatches of different colors and different recipes. And that's a really helpful resource for me to go back to when I'm developing a new print. And so it's just lots of color experimentation and creating a system that I know I can replicate and expand. You're, you're saying that you're dyeing the paper, but you're using a pigment, a gouache, which is an opaque watercolor that's usually brushed onto something. Are you, you're diluting it and then soaking the paper? It's a vat dyeing process. Okay. Yeah. I use, um, I use a really special system of Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> Large Tupperware. And I, you know, I've kind of designed a hanging system so I can, I can hang it to dry it. And so it's also beautiful when it's in production, you know, these streaming pieces of paper and the color and filling the room with those papers is really attractive and satisfying to me. And then the drips on the floor, like everything about the process, I really enjoy. I I feel an installation piece coming on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I've definitely thought about it. Maybe for maybe if I can do a residency or something like right. that. Right, that's great. great. Well, so tell us about the series of the seven figures plus the one that will be joining them shortly. So the series is called "Carrying Things from Home," and it's so far comprised of seven figures. Each one is this totemic being that represents a soul identity and kind of um, purpose in life. And the impetus for this series is my Ukrainian family history. My father's Ukrainian, and he and his parents left World War II uh, very suddenly with what they could carry with them, and they became war refugees. 
And they traveled for several years and were sponsored to come here by the Tolstoy Foundation. And so this idea of displacement and loss and identity, personal and cultural identity and longing and belonging, all these ideas are, are woven into this relief work. And it draws heavily upon my interest in indigenous Ukrainian motifs and art forms and textiles, especially. And then I also have a, a big interest in botany and plants, love plants of the American South and Southwest. And so the figures are adorned in these textiles. They allude to faraway places that are, you know, the figures are, are melancholic, you know, maybe they're they're from a place that is lost or cannot be returned to, um, but I root them to a new homeland with the botanical imagery, the flora and fauna of the American South and Southwest that surrounds them. That is the series in a nutshell. Okay. And each of the figures looks like a... Oh, they look like a Matryoshka doll. <laughs> let, let me, let me help. <laughs> yes, yes. So they're loosely based off that that form. And that's something that I came to when I was in school. I found printmaking in community college. I did that for a handful of years. I went to university at UT Austin, continued my print interest there. So I was drawing these characters and creating narratives and they were very, you know, round and cute. And I... I like to, to kind of joke around, you know, I had this professor that said at one point I should be designing Hallmark cards. because, <gasps> Yeah, but I know, I know, but also sick burn, <laughs> but too, you know, I, cuteness and femininity and beauty in work and the acceptance of that is a whole other topic conversation. I love beauty. I love cuteness. I embrace that about my work. People often say it's cute. And it's also monumental. And I think that that combination, you know, cuteness disarms people. It opens us. It makes us receptive. We feel safe. And then we can start to have introspection and communication. And I love for there to be a space between my work and a viewer so that they can enter that conversational space and we can explore things that are hurtful and painful, you know, and, and hopefully my greatest dream is to start to heal some ancestral trauma, some familial trauma. Um, ah, inherited trauma. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there are lots of losses, <clears throat> excuse me, kinds of losses in the world, but loss of home it's unimaginable for those of us who were, you know, brought up in the suburbs of New York City. Like it's, it's another world. It's very bewildering. And I am very Texan. I, you know, I have my community here and I've been embraced by the print community and I have amazing friends and colleagues in the arts and so I also don't know. I don't know what that's like either. But I but I know that there's loss and it's something that I feel and it's something that I've invested. I'm not the one that left my home, but my father was. And I think that there's a lot of um, ways that that has manifested in my life, of course. And then also to be from a, a just almost continuously war-torn country and that these are things that are still happening all over the world. There's just a, that there's a lot to say too about my ability to make art about it because I'm here now. So those are all the, yeah, those are all pretty profound things that I think about quite often. Well, and, and sad in a way that your work has, that your work has a new urgency because of, you know, what's going on with, with, Russia and, and Ukraine. It's incredible. I mean, oh my God. I don't want to start. Is your dad still alive? Yeah, he is. He is. He just turned 83 last year. Yeah. And he, he's not only, he's not only alive, he's also still performing, um, which is what he's done his entire life. He still plays with the um, symphony and the orchestra and he teaches. He's retired from his career, but he still performs. 
I have this image of him with an accordion, but what is it? What was he teaching? Oh, he plays violin. Okay. He plays violin. Yeah, my grandfather was the accordion. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's funny, though, because um, I learned not long ago that my dad became a violinist because the fiddle player in my grandfather's Ukrainian folk band um, moved, moved away. And so they needed a new violinist. And so he had my new dad do it. He just picked it up and presto. He just picked it up and presto. And he, you know, he started at a very early age. And then um, my grandfather sadly passed when my dad was, I think, 23. So then he was performing and teaching um, to support the family. And that just became his, his whole life. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. But the other thing about the figures, I mean, the, the, there's something about their eyes that it always makes me think of anime characters. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure why, but there's something about the shape and the, the sort of dark, almost like football. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So they have a very doll-like quality to them in the eyes and the simplified, very like immediate emotional representation I guess I should say their their pupils are usually very large they have you know the water shine to them the cheeks you know I think of them as like rosy doll cheeks but they're not they're black and they're prominent and they run from the you know immediately under the eye down to the corner of the face and so that's also kind of this visual cue that I use to this deeper content you know it's not just it's not just a, a round, cute, approachable <laughs> form. And then, of course, you know, there's a lot of elements, too, that are darker. You know, maybe a, a child-sized coffin in the arms <laughs> or a pierced animal yeah. or, right. you know, things that, you know. So I talk about this approachability and cuteness because that is something that I think can't be understated. But, yeah, it's not all there is. <laughs> so. Well, the thing that hit me first was the, that they're all holding sort of a, you know, something right at their chest level mm -hmm. that helps you understand what the, I think the most important thing that they took from home, that the thing that symbolizes home for them is mm -hmm. the thing that they're carrying. Yeah. I don't know. I think for me, I mean, it was just, it was like such a, a good way to, I mean, cause people are more than the roles they play in a community. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But but knowing, you know, my identity is so wrapped up in my work as a curator, like I know exactly how that if I couldn't carry that around with me, I would be mm. lost. Sure. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, now my work is so wrapped up in who I think I am. Yeah, it's such a central part of my life. Yeah. And so they each have something that alludes to their their personhood and their identity. So the figures are the mariner for exploration and the hunter for food. There's a builder for shelter. Um, there's a musician for the arts. There's a mother and an undertaker for life and death. The most recent is the healer, which is a bit more um, metaphysical and personal. And then the final in the series is going to be The Fool, which will also be um, a bit esoteric. So those are the figures in this series. Well, so that brings up a question. Is if the last two are sort of, sort of a little bit uh, less concrete ideas about who they are, did, when you started it, did you know I'm going to do one through eight and these are who they're going to be? Or does it did it morph over time as, as you've grown and changed? A little bit of both. I kind of realized from the beginning that I wanted there to be eight. And I pretty quickly designated the identities of them. The healer was going to be the judge. And that in, um, I guess, when, when was it that I decided to change it to the healer? It was before I got ill. Um, and we may touch on that. But um, I think it was also during our, our political climate of 2016 that I just kind of realized, you know, the judge just isn't going to fit this. I think I want it to be a healer. Well, the judge has become so political now. It's, it doesn't hold the same kind of weight for me. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And I, and I wanted there to be a, just a different energy in the piece as well. Something right. that's, that's more um, uplifting and hopeful, I think, than something judgmental. Right. <laughs> it's, the title. it's so interesting to me because the, the figures and we're, we're, we will move on to other work. Sorry, people, but I just love these. They're, they're life size. They look like these dolls, but they also have this sort of, you know, um, the elders kind of a presence. Mm -hmm. And in my made up mind about what the elders, the elder women in a Russian or Ukrainian or Eastern European or whatever, mm -hmm. Greece mm -hmm. uh, kind of community is always in black and always silent mm -hmm. and always a little bit, of, a little bit terrifying. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. There's a lot of color. And especially in Eastern Europe, a lot of um, beadwork and beautiful embroidery and flowers um, and botanical imagery, highly high adornment. And so they, each of these figures too has a, a crown that they're wearing, which is a, you know, kind of alluding to the traditional cr flower crowns and beaded crowns that Ukrainian women um, wear around ceremony. So that element is there along with the, the embroidery and the stylistic outline of traditional um, clothes on the textiles. Earlier, you, you mentioned the idea of indigenous communities in Ukraine. And, and for me, I, I was like, wait, isn't, aren't the people who are Ukrainian, haven't they always been? And, and is there a separation between what we would consider to be indigenous versus other people who are have been there for a long time, like pe people who are maintaining um, traditions of of when they were nomadic peoples, or like how do you how do you? Oh yeah, so I was referring to the the traditionally Ukrainian embroideries, and yes, different regions have different stylizations and different um, symbols in their imagery in the folk arts that that carry different like different talismans or different symbols of, you know, fertility or good fortune. And so, yeah, when I, when I say that it's to um, allude to those visual languages that are Ukrainian. Okay. Uh, gosh, it's such an interesting words are so bizarre, you know, mm -hmm. like what I was bringing to indigenous is different than what you're bringing to indigenous. Oh, sure. Thing. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about sort of traditional costume and embroidery and things like that, like mm -hmm. the word folk came in my ma mind, which is mm -hmm. a bad word now, you know, like, ah, you can't win. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's why conversation is so great. And to, yeah, to, and, and also conversation about the culture and arts, you know, and, and to express these ideas clearly. Sure. Yeah. So you have you have a show up that's about to close as we're recording this at Flatbed Press with your your buddies Alyssa, Catherine, and Mike, and I saw some pictures on your gram. Yes, that looked super cool, including the seven figures that you have framed. Oh my god, I can't imagine <laughs> how much that cost. But then you have these uh, smaller works, and some of them have um, some cording that is crossed in front of the glass. And mm. I wanted to ask you what is happening. Yes. So those are part of a series of um, collages. So to introduce those, I'll introduce my collage practice, which really arose out of my desire to use the materials I produce. And so a lot of times prints that don't make an addition because I shink clay so much, they're often on thin papers that lend themselves really well to collage and layering and cutting. Um, and then with my scrap dyed paper, I like to selectively ink and print design elements from my editions. And I'll cut out those pieces and create collage work that I think of as like visual poems or incantations is the word that I'll use sometimes. So uh, there's a lot of hands, there's a lot of botanical imagery, there's um, celestial imagery, there's seeds. So a lot of this imagery has to do with like an incantation or a prayer or, you know, ideas like that, hope and longing. Yeah. So I started adorning the frames as a way to 
kind of strengthen that idea of like a talisman. And I'm and I also have a, a budding interest in in traditional paper cutting too, Eastern European paper cutting, which is very strong in Poland, very strong in Ukraine. And um traditionally those were, you know, they'd be hung over windows and doors and, you know, the tree of life is very present and therefore good fortune and to dispel God's spirits. So this work is is I think you know, referential of that. And so for these pieces that you're thinking of, their hands that are floating above them are different um, seeds or botanical elements, and the hands are holding them almost an offering. Then there are copper tacks driven into the face of the frame around which I have woven uh, with a twine just to create a different visual pattern around the piece, but it also makes the frame and the print a cohesive object in, you know, working in unison. Um, so it's, it's almost like a little, yeah, almost like a little talisman. Hmm. Cause the, I mean, you, you, now you've created a, the frame and everything else, like it's, a, it's an object now, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and when you were things, you know, this is the weird thing about when you're talking to people, like the vi images that were flashing into my brain were the God's eyes we used to make as kids. Oh, you make yeah, those? I remember those. I remember yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone remember those. Yeah. <laughs> but also when you wrap a brown paper package and you have the, you know, the strings going from both sides and you pick up the paper, mm -hmm. uh, the cord, yeah, you can carry the thing. So it's like you're, it's almost like a portable something that you're going to pick up mm -hmm. but there's also the fact that it visually is crossing in front of your image it does, yeah in a almost could be i'm xing it out sort of a way so it's so it's almost like a a could be a block yeah know? it's interesting i try to do it so that the core imagery in the frame is kind of almost framed again with the twine the opening of the twine but it definitely does cross in front of the, the imagery. So you almost have to peek inside of it, which okay. is also something I'm interested in. These are very small. These are like five by seven. Okay. So they're, they're hand held, they're hand size. Right. And I'm interested in doing them larger. I was actually talking to a friend of mine about casting some larger tacks and doing, doing this on larger frames and just in creating a more physical object. And I have some of these where I have um, used rhinestones and have built letters with those rhinestones. They're black and not quite shiny, not quite matte. So they're not, um, I wouldn't say it's gaudy, but it's definitely ornamental. <laughs> uh, and so I, you know, I'll, I'll create words with those. So I also have a series of paper comet collages that are titled Good Luck Stray Star. And so that text wraps around these frames in the, with the um, rhinestone letters. Fascinating. Now I'm trying to like thread through all of the varying ways you're making images and yeah. finding the through line. All right, I'm gonna have to think about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for that direction and would love to do more and would love to expand the scale of that and the scale of my collage work as well it's usually very um intimate it's intimately sized but i do love it and so now i'm actually starting to this project is not published fully yet but i'm now designing some etchings that will be an addition in and of itself but then i'm also designing it with my collage in mind so that I can also create almost like a like a flash sheet, you know, I can create this this imagery for collage and and expand upon it in scale. Mm -hmm. huh. cool. So that's exciting to uh, to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you want to talk about your medical year that two years that you had, or do you want yeah, to yeah when I almost died? I almost yeah, died. that that time that time was really profound and. Has yeah, I was diagnosed very suddenly with an autoimmune disease. So I got really ill in 2020. In a matter of a few months, I had to move home with my parents. I was on FMLA leave from work. I couldn't work, um, couldn't live on my own. And my ability just diminished um, so significantly. And I was very ill and underwent extensive hospitalizations. And so 
this lasted until 2022 when I finally reached remission with the help of, um, this was my, my Hail Mary medication because the other treatments for these autoimmune autoimmunity is so it's not, nobody really knows what's going on. (laughs) So these things are, um, really hard to diagnose and really hard to treat. Sometimes, sometimes people are very fortunate and it gets resolved quickly. Um, I went through every class of medication available and just continued to decline to the point where I was approved for hospice. Oh, God. And um, also, talk, you know, talking about our identities, this is just an offshoot, but our identities and who we think we are, you know, you, you with, you know, our history and it's such an integral part of you and then me with my practice and I'm a printmaker and losing the ability to, to do anything. And then also my creativity was just gone. I just thought I would never be in my studio again. And at that point I was very, you know, I had accepted it. It was a lot of really intense work that I had to do mentally. So my, my last medication worked, which is incredible. And it's also $16,000 a dose per injection, $16,000 per injection. So it's, horribly expensive. And the first time I, oh, I had even, I had even more expensive medications. I would have to go and sit in an infusion center and, um, you know, they would hook me up to an IV and they would run the medications that way. So that was, you know, $18,000 in an infusion center. So I guess it's kind of good. Those medications didn't work for me because at least (laughs) I I have a $2,000 break. I'm very fortunate to have health insurance that covers half of that. I'm also in that my copay is $8,000. So I'm in a couple of different copay assistant programs. Um, so that's very complicated and leaves a lot to be thought about in terms of my stability and safety and the ability to stay in remission. So, you know, I was, I was trying this medication. I did finally reach remission in 2022 and then entered a also incredibly difficult period of recovery. And, you know, I had horrible panic attacks and depression and PTSD and just a lot of medical trauma to go through and loss of ability and physical therapy to regain strength and mobility. And, you know, eventually I became, you know, I started feeling creativity again and drive to be in my studio. And so the healer, the newest one in my large series, is the first piece that I have made in my studio um, since really getting my life back. And I think of this time now as my second life because I did not think I was going to be here. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. Jesus, Lord, have mercy. Yeah, pretty And crazy. they have no idea why. No, have- this started when I was 30. And, um, that's very late for the onset of autoimmunity and autoimmunity also doesn't run in my family. But then again, we don't know much about my dad's side of the family. So that comes into it, you know, the medical along with everything else, medical history. And so, yeah, who knows? Nobody, nobody knows why it would have started. It was super fast in six months. You know, I, I, I was cycling a lot. So I was going basically from cycling in my best form, 50 miles, you know, a day to being bedridden, um, at my parents' house in about six months. So it's just really crazy. And no, there are no sufficient answers. My medication can also, um, cause cancer. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So I have to do a lot of medical upkeep and my ability is just not, you know, it's just not, I I still have a lot of, a lot of areas where I'm still learning myself and it's interesting. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping eventually one of my specialists is willing to help me try to back off the medication once I'm in deep remission for two years. So I'm hoping to be able to do that and have freedom from the bill and also the really scary and the, the medical maintenance and then, you know, scary possibility of, um, side effects. Right. Well, how often do you have to take this $16,000 baby? It's 
every eight weeks. Aye. So yeah, it's it's shipped to my house in a cooler, and yeah, it's an injection that I do. I I don't I. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know. Yeah, the not knowing I think would drive me batty, but I assume that one just must turn to being grateful to be alive and having that take the place of the worry. Yeah, you know, and it's and it's interesting because once you're in, once you're like in the churn of the medical system in this country. It's like you really realize so much of healthcare is administration. Mm. And it's so hard to get actual care that's not crazy expensive things or surgeries just being prescribed. And I they were pushing me into all, you know, trying to push me into surgeries that I'm so glad I didn't do. And like with autoimmunity, it's like there's no definitive test for a lot of autoimmune diseases. You look at your bucket of symptoms and you throw a medication at it and see what what happens. And a lot of my symptoms, you know, they thought I might have Crohn's disease, but a lot of those digestive, I couldn't methylate nutrients from my food. Oh. And so I was just starving. Basically, for a while I was just star I was just starving. Um became very malnourished, which, which led to a lot of my, my, you know, loss of ability and mobility. And, um, but then I had a lot of neurological problems and I had crazy hormonal imbalances. And then I would have, you know, my joints would swell up like crazy or my hands would start shaking. So I couldn't even write. And just like all these, you know, full systemic and it was at that point, that was when it was really bad. And it started with, you know, a handful of symptoms and getting tests for that. And they saw my elevated white blood cells. So they're like, okay, autoimmune disease. Then it was just a whole bunch of tests and labs and trying to figure it out while I got sicker and sicker and medications that weren't working. So by the time it was really bad, it was just like a, like dominoes. It was just like a house of cards that was falling down in this cascade effect that, you know, the, the other systems in my body were just not able to compensate. So once you're, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think how, like, we're so resilient, but then at a certain point, it's just like, wow, life is so fragile. You know, it's, it's a really interesting dichotomy. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've come to feel that all of life is double thought. Everything's an opposition, right? Life, death, whatever. Oh, Yeah. I've never really thought that way until recently. I'm like, you know what? Everything does. It's like, I don't know. My brain isn't structured that way somehow. But now I'm like, oh, yeah. Now I see it. Oh, yeah. I have. Yeah. I've always felt like straddled between opposites that way in so many areas of my life. And I joke that's why I like to work in pairs and diptychs and um, in opposites often. Because <laughs> it's the way I deal with that. Are you a Gemini or a Libra? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Gemini. <laughs> Yes, I am. Yeah, it's actually it's funny. I'm a I actually I do know this. Um I am a Gemini sun and like rising and Libra moon. Oh. If I, I said that, that right. I'm oh, I you got know. both. I've got both, yeah. Oh. But I double down on the Gemini. Okay. Wow. I that's all that's pretty much all I know about. <laughs> I don't know what my rising things are. I've never really yeah. checked that well, out, but all I know is I'm very Capricorn. Whenever I read Capricorn, I'm like, oh, that's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's funny because um, I had friends that got really into, like there's a there's like a horoscope app. And so I joined that with my friends. And then that's how I learned about that. And that, then I became just interested in it. Oh my gosh, it's incredible. <laughs> On the PTSD part, have you done any... EMDR sort of work to try and I was those? in different therapies for that and the alpha stem was very helpful for me which is a, a like a brain wave um therapy I'm going to do a terrible job of describing this but it's it's like a you put these little um electrodes on your earbuds and you can set it to a different setting but it it works with the alpha waves in your brain using really light electrical pulses are the pulse, do they alternate? It alternates. Because that's and very much what EMDR is like. Yes. Yes, it is. And I I didn't do, the, the alpha stem is what I did along with some other therapies and some medications and um, 
did that with doctor guidance, but this is something that is also prescribed to vets for PTSD. Right. And, right. Um, yeah, it's, um, it was really helpful and I still, I still do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, 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 you can set your level based on your comfort and it's, you know, you, you do it so that you're not getting like motion sick, but it can make you feel like you're like rocking back and forth on a boat. Oh. It's kind of, yeah, it's funky. Oh, I get, I get seasick. That would be bad. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be. <laughs> You'd have to do the, do the, the little level. Right. <laughs> exactly. God. I mean, I'm sure that your, your work has changed, but I feel like the essence of you has, has, come through and it's, it hasn't been cut out or pushed aside by this traumatic experience of this really weird illness thing, yeah. which obviously is to your credit, but I, it just sort of gives me hope in humanity that, that our essences won't just sort of dissolve, you know, that, that there's always, it's always there somewhere. You just have to kind of let it come back. Yeah. That's a beautiful thought and to give it space and time too. Like I had to come back to myself and kind of relearn, relearn myself. And I ended up having to do that very intentionally too. And yeah, there are ideas and and themes in my work that I think have just really solidified. My collage practice really solidified during that time because it's what I could sit and do. And in some, in some of my hospitalizations where I was like a little more alert and able to work on stuff I had my little collage pieces there and would would work on those and I think that really helped my sanity but it's also um definitely informed the new etching work that I'm doing again to plug future projects um that I hope I can get to soon frustrating I'm sure everybody everybody knows about this in their life but it's like our work is years ahead of where we are right because like our ideas travel so much faster and work so much faster than we're physically able to and so there's so much work that i'm eager to get to now and i'm excited to get to and my ideas have developed so much faster than i can make the work or you know it faster than i have time to work so wow oh that's great yeah huh you must have a lot in your head <laughs> i wish i'd it could turn it down a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> do you have like um? Do you have, do you have a sketchbook? We've talked about sketchbooks with a couple of artists, and everybody has a different approach. It's fascinating. I'm not a sketchbook person, and that's a practice that I've always wanted to develop. But sketchbooks just kind of freak me out. And I I like to draw, but I have to draw on loose sheets of paper. There's something oh. about the binding. I love a good sketchbook, but I have to have loose papers. And so I often draw on tracing paper um, because I like being able to layer things, which I guess is the printmaker in me, but I don't like working on opaque paper. And then I like I like the, like a vellum as a, as a drawing surface too. So uh, that's how I do it. And I often draft for prints. I'll make thumbnail sketches of things um, and I write notes. I take notes about things I'm thinking of, but I I will often think of my drawing practice as drafting for a print. Right. Okay. That's fair. But I'd love to draw. I'd love to draw more. And I actually, I would, I would like to um, learn how to do it on an iPad. (laughs) (laughs) an old old elder millennial here but um I think it would be nice because it would be it would be easy for me to um to take around with me and people would say well so is a sketchbook but I don't like sketchbooks so I think that would be a good in between right maybe I find that I mean as somebody who writes a lot like I don't have a journal I don't keep a journal I hate I hate journaling yeah that's talk about what we feel now <laughs> yeah sure. but it's it's um the ipad like if 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 it's not sitting out where i can see it it's gone mm-hmm. like that would not work for me <laughs> yeah yeah i, mm-hmm. I get that too and i talk about this you know this idea of like oh i'd like to develop that practice i have no idea if i would right. i need to play with it and see if it's valid right right exactly. valid for me. yeah yeah <laughs> All right. So you're working on some etchings. Anything else that's coming up we need to know about? 
I am going to start development on the final piece in the series, The Fool, when I can manage to start. So that will be coming. And I think the best place to follow my progress is my Instagram because I do post a lot of process there and progress stuff. And that's just my name, Annalise Kotovich. But um, other than that, I have a show coming up in Santa Fe at the end of the year, which I'm very excited about. Lovely gallery there that shows a lot of works on paper. I'm um, called Hecho Gallery. And Frank there does an amazing job with his artist and um, showing a lot of print. And then um, I will be doing, um, really excited about this, and I don't think there's a reason to not announce it but i'm going to be doing the in cahoots residency in the fall of this year oh, which cool. is going to be really thrilling so that will be two weeks of dedicated work time oh that's great and, yeah which will be super fun my first time doing well second time doing a, a residency like this because usually i do academic residencies so it's like five days very intense working with a team and you know there's student mentorship and usually a lecture, you know, so it's, it's very intense and very short because that's usually what I can fit into my work schedule. So it'll be interesting um, tackling a larger residency and seeing how that is the, is in cahoots. Is that the one out in Sonoma? Yes. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Yeah. I just, I didn't know about them till recently. I was like, Oh, who are these folks? Yeah, I have followed, I have followed them for a little while and seeing their facilities being built and then some artists going out there who I admire. Um, and so I decided to throw my hat in the ring and I would love to, I would love to do more residencies and try to develop some of these ideas because it's just, it's hard for me to feel like I can make meaningful progress on evenings and weekends and that continues to be a frustration of mine. <laughs> I'm trying to to figure out how to how to manage in my life. Yeah, I, I can imagine that would be really frustrating. Like I, I don't know how people do it. You know, come home and go straight into the studio. Like oi, oi, oi. It's it's harder for me than it used to be. Yeah. Um, and back when I was working at um, the print shop, I would have my day job, and then I would go take a break, and I would just come back and work in the shop and sell publish and that worked really well now my job is just it's it's just very different so I leave my work studio and I come home I'm usually pretty exhausted because I'm working on my feet all day and then you know I, ha I have to go to my studio and get started and then by that time it's like it's like dinner time sometimes I'm more successful in the practice than other times my sure. stamina also just doesn't last the way that it used to fatigue hits me very differently now so you know I try to I try to keep work out and accessible and just do what I can a little chunk at a time right and I know that very big things are possible a little tiny bit at a time right right so that tends to be my mo okay well, that's fair yeah yeah I'm 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 a morning person so I'm worthless after about four o'clock <laughs> Yeah, I love mornings. I I have been kind of training myself to be a morning person. So now I'm trying to, and I and I do this successfully for a while until I you know I get a bit too fatigued and I have to change my routine. But I try to to be at work seven thirty to three thirty, mm. and then I can go take a break and then have an evening slash night um, at the studio. Nice. So, yeah. All right. Well, we've talked for longer than an hour, which I always find amazing how quickly mm -hmm. an hour can go. It just flies by. It flies Absolutely. right by. It really does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So people should follow you on Instagram and they should uh, keep a lookout for all the wonderful things that are coming your way because things are coming your way. It's so great. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a big studio year. I'm hoping I churn out some of these new publications I'm thinking about. I, yeah. One last question about the series. Are you selling them individually or have you sold a, a whole set with the promise of the eighth one coming? I have in? not, not no. yet. They're, they are usually sold individually. I think the most I've sold um, to one person or institution is four. Okay. I would love to house a whole suite somewhere. So that is, that's a dream for sure. And I think, you know, when they're, when you see them installed all together, the way that they're in conversation with one another just makes 
it just really it makes it alive. It brings it to life, you know, and of course, that's the way I intend them to be seen. And I have this exhibition right now at the Plains Art Museum in Fargo. So that is the first time I've seen all seven come together. And that was really amazing. They really look fabulous. Thank you. They really honored me with that with that show and that placement and the, the work that they've done there with, with my work. Um, so that's really special. And then flatbed here, the flatbed show is the second time I've seen them, but the first time in Austin, which is here, you know, where I'm based. So really, really I feel, I feel like the, they're like, um, was it Mulan and where all the ancestors are, are surrounding her as she's deciding to, you know, go fight. As- that's cool. You know, I haven't seen that. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. She's sort of like trying to figure out what she's doing and she goes yeah. to visit the ancestors and the, you know, family ancestor house yeah. and they're all sort of sitting around and you know, they're all like lifting her up, you know, that's how yeah. I feel about your pieces. Oh, that's beautiful. Annalise, thank you for coming on plate Mark. It's been lovely talking to you and I just, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Anne. It's been a real pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Hey, Thanks for listening to this episode of Plate Mark with Annalise Gratovich. She is one of the artists in the 5x5 show, part of Print Austin's Winter Festival in 2024. I hope you enjoyed her talk. She's a delight and I do love her work. So I hope you will check her out, look her up, follow her on her socials and um, help her make her dreams come true. Thank yous need to go out as usual. Well, one, of course, to Annalise for being a great guest. Thank you. And one to Dan Fury of Extension Audio for his help with sound and editing. One to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. And one to Skip Barnhart and Lee Turner for the use of their studio sounds at the top and end of the show. Now you're supposed to go over to the website, platemarkpodcast.com. Check out all the images we put there for you to get a gander at Annalise's work. And also hit the support and donate button. Become a monthly subscriber and you will help me keep the lights on. It's a labor of love and it's just me. Okay, I think that's it. We'll see you next time.